Karen Rubin Lang, PhD. Uh, clinical psychologist, which means that I practice, and I pri practice privately. Uh, fee for service, I don't get massive sums for anything I do unless I were to write books. I'm not an academic psychologist. Oh, good so far. Uh, what did I do? I had breakfast, <laughs> I had lunch. <laughs> uh, I was with my boyfriend and we uh, cleaned up our room and talked a lot. I met him here on my second month here and I had left my husband 47 years. Mm -hmm partly because he thought I was disabled, because I couldn't walk well, and I had neurological difficulties, and I was afraid of Alzheimer's because my father had it, and he started treating me as if I was semi-Alzheimer-ish, and I'm not. And my son said one day, you know, you're not happy here, and he bought me a walker. He said, I'm not telling you to get out of here permanently. <laughs> But, you know, take a few more walks. And after a while, our grandson was born, and I could see that my husband was no more interested in our grandson than he had been in my son. And I thought, I can't do this anymore. And my son said, it's painful to come over and visit, too. It's just painful to see how he pushes you out of, out of the way. They have a good relationship now. My husband and I have a great relationship. But as it happens, I always knew I hadn't met the love of my life. Do you guys use that term still? Yeah. <laughs> Good, then you know what it is. <laughs> but I'd hear that and I'd just be a little envious and I'd say, I love my husband very, very much, but he's not the love of my life. And I guess I won't have that. And when I came here, I met someone who I really took to. And he took to me. And we have wonderful conversations. He's, he loves jazz as much as I do. He loves art and music as much as I do. And got a job working as a textbook editor at a publishing house, big publishing house, so big textbooks. And I liked that because it was very intellectual. I liked that because I knew how to write well. And basically I got man manuscripts that were not well written and fixed them up. So that was a, a fun job for me. Uh, I left it because it became clear that to move up in that business, by the way, being a woman, I was stereotyped, didn't really recognize it, but women usually were editors with a green eye shade and pencil, and the men were the ones who went out, found the authors, and took them out for drinks, and had all the fun out there bringing authors to write books. And they would write the books, and I would go over them, but I didn't get any, any visibility in terms of being in the world. Uh, now that was probably a stereotype, but it, I didn't see it, not really. It was a great job. Yeah, my experiences with racism is so positive. My father, after my mother died, married an African-American woman. She was black, she still calls her, still called herself black for a blip there, everyone was African-American. I certainly pick up on it quickly, partly as a result of hanging out with my stepmother, who picked it up so quickly when she entered our family. There were women who had lived in Pasadena, et cetera, and they were racist, and she saw it like that. I'd never seen it. And she, she told me who she was discouraged about, and she had no, no desire to win them over. She didn't believe she had to and wouldn't, and I appreciated that so cool and she was very active in the 60s and still an academic she was really head on her shoulders and hung out with Maya Angelou and Quincy Jones and those are her friends and she would say let's have family for Thanksgiving and it would be Quincy and Maya and Sydney and Brock Peters and Jimmy Baldwin I mean it was amazing and a very happy experience for me and I wasn't really she so well, I grew up with a lot of black people, jazz musicians primarily, and I really grew to love jazz, and I'm something of an aficionado, partly because of my husband. And her in my life was just such a plus, and we had so much fun. 
and I got to know her very well when we drove around looking for homes like this for her because she was in her 80s by then and not doing so well intellectually. But what story I want to tell is why she is such a great woman is toward the end of her life we were at her place like this and she was looking out the window and she said, I wonder if the people here get parking spaces. And I said, huh, parking spaces? And then, aha, people here are black that work here. And she said, I don't think so. We have a black president and we've gotten nowhere. <laughs> As she, her work had not ended. She didn't consider herself a success until the whole world was a success. And she even said, until everyone has parking spaces, we've got nowhere. And God, I love her for that so much. I admire her for that so much. So that was a very good experience. I have an interesting experience from my practice. This was when Rodney King was killed. I had a number of patients. I had one redneck guy that I almost a few times because there were racist overtones to so much of what he said, but I didn't feel that I was in a position to address it. That wasn't my job. And I didn't know enough about him to address it. I didn't really know his history. I tried to find out, but I didn't want to slant it toward what a ra racist bastard he was. <laughs> so I tried to be open. And I'm glad I was, because on the Rodney King afternoon, he's the only patient who mentioned it at all, and it was you guys weren't alive, but it was a really an awful day. And he's the only one who mentioned it, and he came in with tears in his eyes. And he said, this is the worst thing Los Angeles has ever done. And I was so startled and so moved. And I thought, you know, you never really know it all. And I treated him differently after that. I mean, it was my racism dismissed him because he made somewhat racist remarks, or my anti-racism, racism, if you will. But I learned so much from that, you never know. So hang in with everyone. So I knew that I was a quarter Jewish. It didn't mean anything to me. My parents never talked to me about it. I mean, literally never talked to me about it. But I. In high school, one of the mothers said when I joined this club, my last name was Reuben, and I'm a quarter Jewish on my grand, not on my mother's side, which I turned out to be very important, which I think, you know, doesn't matter to me. But the woman said, this isn't going to be another Julie title bomb, is it? And I went home and asked my mother, what does she mean by calling me a Julie title bomb? She said, literally, there's, well, Karen, there's no, nothing we've never really discussed with you. And she had told, told me about anti-Semitism and about my Jewish identity, my part Jewish identity. And I was so surprised and didn't really take it in. But when I went to NYU, I was rushed by a Jewish sorority and got the picture that there was prejudice on both sides, a lot of prejudice on both sides, and that it was kind of an awful thing. Um, My husband says something, my husband said something almost funny. It was funny. I had the last name Reuben, so a lot of people thought I was Jewish. And it's, sometimes that bothered me, because it was a stereotype. Sometimes it bothered me because I was prejudiced enough to think that Jewish were lesser, or some kind of weird, which unfortunately wasn't positive. And my husband said, he's Jewish and his last name is Lang. And he said, well, I think you wanted to get rid of your last name, so you married a Jew to get rid of your last name. <laughs> and, you know, I burst out laughing, because that's very witty. Uh, very witty. It's one of the things I really loved about him, as a wit. Um, and there's some truth to it. I didn't, but I didn't know he was Jewish. I didn't know my true love was Jewish. I don't, didn't know my friends were Jewish. And they are, most of them. But that's some prejudice I experienced inter interiorly against myself. Mm -hmm. And I know a little bit, therefore, I think, about Jewish self-hatred. I've got a really wild one, okay? 
Um, when I I'd lived in Venice for many years, and we actually kept our back door open, <laughs> which is pretty. And we had you know we had hippies living on our back porch, and it, it was a time. It was the '60s, and it was rock and roll. And I knew Jim Morrison, and I met Bob Dylan, and it was the streets. And I, as a visitor, clearly a visitor, but I enjoyed that very, very much. My friends were UCLA students who were, I hate to say slummy, but I'll use that word, but we wanted to live in Venice and we knew we didn't have to, which makes us quite different than many people there. Um, so I moved to, I happened to move to Westwood, because that's where my practice was, and I had an ideal little cottage situation. And one night, and I had a cat, someone was coming in my window, I assumed it was my cat, and it wasn't. Someone had come into my bed and was fooling with me. I should mention these were the days of Charlie Manson. Manson. And I looked up and it was a black guy. I looked in his eyes and the first thing I thought was, he doesn't look crazy. He's, he's not a white crick Charlie Manson guy. Maybe, this is so bad, maybe he thinks that he can do this because he's oppressed and that he has, you know, he has real reasons for doing this. So he's reasonable, he's not crazy. So I acted reasonable and I said, you don't want to do this, I know you don't want to do this and I'll turn on the light and we'll have a cigarette together but I know you don't want to do this and he left. Someone said later, well, he left because you said you'd turn on the light <laughs> and identify him later. But it really worked. I really gave him the benefit of the doubt in terms of what kind of person he was. But I came from a racist place. It's amazing. I looked at the black face and said, you're not crazy, you're not Charlie Manson. That's pretty amazing. But I'm telling on myself that that's my thought process. I wouldn't have expected that. What AA taught me was if you have a bad thought about anyone in any way, ask yourself, how is this me instead of them? And that'll make you think. If you have any kind of a negative thought about someone, you just ask yourself, 